Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks so much for coming to the AAS Distinguished Lecture event this afternoon. Uh, I'm Susie Hutchings, President Emerita of the Australian Anthropological Society. And as an Arundel woman, I acknowledge that we are undertaking these proceedings on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Wurrung peoples. And I pay respects to elders past and present. And I also acknowledge all First Nations peoples here today and to our esteemed distinguished lecturer, uh, Professor Kathleen Butler, who I'll introduce a bit more formally in a moment. And we did have um, uh, elder uncle Ringo Terrick um, booked for this afternoon, but he's been held up. So um, uh, just to let you know that, that he was going to speak this afternoon as well. We want to acknowledge yeah. him as well. Uh, and he would have given a welcome to country. Uh, so thanks so much, Uncle Ringo, for offering to do that. And also I want to um, acknowledge Phoebe McCoolrath, who is going to respond, or at, well, would have responded, uh, but you were going to, you're going to do a, a formal acknowledgement as well. Thank you. Uh, the Distinguished Lecture in Anthropology was introduced by the AAS in 2009 as a lecture series that is open to the public to, uh, to extend anthropological knowledge and to disseminate ideas that challenge and inspire debate on important social issues in Australia and internationally. The Distinguished Lecture series has continued on a mostly biennial basis as an important feature of the AAS annual conference. And it is with very great pleasure, respect and acknowledgement that I introduced our Distinguished Lecturer for this year's Australian Anthropological Society Conference, Professor Kathleen Butler, who is a member of the Bundjalung and Wurrumi peoples uh, of what is now known as coastal New South Wales. Professor Butler is the current head of the Wallatooka Institute at the University of Newcastle. And the title of Professor Butler's talk today is Photos, Photos in Wurrumi, Biscuit Tins Exploring the Relationship Between Anthropology and Aboriginal Studies. Thank you so much, welcome. Dear well, everyone, Melissa B. McIlrace. So I'm Associate Professor Kathleen Butler McIlrace, um, eldest child, and I'm really proud to be her daughter. And so I've been invited by my family to provide a formal acknowledgement in order to contextualize my mother's talk. You know, quite often people think it's either a welcome or an acknowledgement, and we kind of want to challenge this because you're supposed to respond to each other. There's a lot of reciprocity and relationship that happens when we have discussions as Aboriginal people. And so I also just want to contextualize why I'm speaking in this way. So we belong to two nations in coastal New South Wales, uh, the Bundjalung Nation and the Warramai Nation. Both of them are matriarchal cultures, but particularly along the Warramai line, I'm an only daughter of an only daughter of an only daughter of an only daughter. So when we think about the transmission of female knowledges, mum and I hold very special places within our family line. And so it really gives me great pleasure to try and open this talk up for my mother and to really speak as guests onto Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country. We affirm the basic customary law of First Nations across the Australian continent to take care of and to not harm this country. We acknowledge eldership that are with us presently. We acknowledge eldership that precede us and we acknowledge the eldership that are, to, that are to come because these are the people that oversee and guide um, the continuing practice of our cultures. They harness the fire for revitalization that we as younger generations must pick up and further foster. And so in contextualizing my mother's contribution to the academy, she's been grouped under a whole series of post-invasion English umbrella terms. We've been called Aboriginal, we've been called Indigenous, recently we've been called First Nations. And in acknowledging country, we shouldn't just acknowledge the country that we're meeting on currently in person. We should also acknowledge the country that we carry with us. And so for us, that means acknowledging the Bunjong and my histories that we carry. And so my, my mother holds a very important role in our family in relationship to the institution because she was the first in our family to finish high school, to go to university. And then she inspired Nunya Gami, my grandmother, her mother to come back with her 
and they were in the same ceremony when my mum got a mom, when my grandmother got her masters and my mother got her PhD. I was nine at that ceremony. And now in turn, I'm the third generation of Aboriginal women to have a bachelor's degree from the University of Newcastle. I'm now on my second degree. And that's because I could have that leadership in front of me. And so in thinking about this, I hope that you, you open your mukas, you open your ears, you open your mikans, you open your eyes, and you view my mother and you listen to my mother in her context, not in these post-invasion English umbrella terms, but in who she actually is, who we actually are, and the countries we carry. Banjan Jagun, where are my bare? Nali na jagun, i bare And we also invite you to consider the country and the histories that you carry, and to think about the people who swept the road for you. My great grandfather, mum's grandfather, was a street sweeper for the Sydney Council. And now myself and one of my younger brothers, um, we were both chosen to be representatives at uh, New South Wales Youth Parliament. And when our father dropped us off both times, he made us walk this long stretch of road. We both thought he was crazy. We thought there's a much quicker way to get to Parliament than this, like we know this. But when he dropped us off at security, he said to us, now the road you walked, that has been swept for you. And there are people who have swept literal and metaphorical roads for us to have the freedom to pursue our aspirations and our passions. So we invite you to think about where we are on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country. We invite you to think about the country that you carry with you as guests onto this land as we are too. And we invite you to think about not just the people who have swept roads for you, but who are you sweeping the road for in turn? Marungu. So it's, it's easy to be inspired when uh, you have great kids mm -hmm. and uh, I'm really lucky to have great kids. Um, Normally I would stand, but uh, last Sunday on my 24th wedding anniversary, I twisted my ankle uh, as my husband and I came home from dinner. So it wasn't quite the romantic night that he had hoped for. Um, <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't normally be sitting. But, you know, I think that what I want to share with you today is what I think comes from the heart of Aboriginal studies which is the power of story and the power of embedding yourself within your position. And so um, Phoebe you know, started that, um, you know, for me. Um, when I chose my title initially, uh, I have an undergraduate degree and a master's in anthropology. And um, because of the nature of the economically rationalist neoliberal university, I ended up with a PhD in sociology, which was more about uh, my ability to be able to meet some of the core teaching for my department. Uh, although, yeah, I've, I've loved that journey as well. And so what I wanted to think about was this idea of genealogies. So, one of the things which really underpins our anthropological knowledge is our understanding of kinship. What are those genealogies? Who are we connected to? Whether that's in a sense of our knowledge systems or whether that's in the sense of our loyalties and our relationships. When I started as an undergraduate at the University of Newcastle in 1990, I was 17 years old. And my lecturer for the core anthropological subject was a Dutch anthropologist named Ari Brandt. And when he walked into the room, he was everything that I had stereotypically imagined an anthropologist to be. He had the little half glasses, the goatee beard, he wore a safari suit and knee-high socks. So whether or not it was from movies or from far side cartoons, that's what I thought an anthropologist would look like. 
the thing that I would say though about the academy at that time is I wasn't what they thought an Aboriginal person looked like. In that first year learning from Ari, I got an amazing amount of terminology and I got a real love for how concepts shape action. He had done uh, the majority of his field work in Indonesia. And so there was that sense in which when, you know, he was talking about emic and etic positions, just dropping a little bit of first year knowledge there. Um, I very much still felt that outsider presence. But what I didn't see was I didn't see myself represented. So anthropology wasn't reflecting back to me the lived experience that I had had and the lived experience that my family had. I was really lucky um, to do some other courses with Ari, but then a, uh, a new anthropologist came to the University of Newcastle and that was Dr. Barry Morris. And he went on to be my supervisor for both my masters and my PhD. And through him, I was exposed to a different set of anthropological relationships to people like Gillian Cowlishaw and Andrew Lattice. And the very first journal article I can ever remember reading where I went, that's true, was Gaynor McDonald's photos in Wiradjuri biscuit tins. And so I wanted, I guess, in a sense of homage to call my, my talk photos in Waramai biscuit tins because um, my Waramai heritage is my grandmother's line. And just like in Gaynor's article, my nan had the tin of photos. So what I thought that I would do is I would take you through, I guess, my journey and my reflections I've taken a very circuitous route um, to end up in Aboriginal studies and as the head of Wallatuka. But I'm always really mindful that while I have my incredibly strong kinship network that raised me, I'm also the inheritor of a tradition of intellectual thought. You know, so I count those people, Barry, Gillian, Andrew, and even though I only ever spoke to her twice, I count Gaynor MacDonald in the kinship and the genealogy of my development as an intellectual person and also as a person who can articulate what it means to be an Aboriginal person in contemporary Australia. As, as Phoebe said, we're very concerned with our genealogies of knowledge and our genealogies of action. It doesn't always have to be what other people see as an Aboriginal life. My grandfather, when he was a street sweeper for the Sydney County Council, did that among many other Aboriginal men. His son, my uncle, followed him into the council and was one of the first Aboriginal people to drive a garbage truck rather than being the one push, to push the broom. People sometimes say to me that my kids are my mini me's. I think it's a bit awkward to say, well, actually they're my maxi me's. Mm -hmm. So I, I call them my turbo upgrades. <laughs> and uh, so um, when people say, you know, think about in terms of your outputs, you know, what are, the three top output, outputs, <laughs> Butler and McElrath 1999, <laughs> Butler and McElrath 2002, and Butler and McElrath 2006. So um, that's the context that I want to start with this talk. It might not be helpful to do it on my laptop. I should do it on this. So the Native American scholar Thomas King says, the truth about stories is that's all we are. One of the things that really attracted me to anthropology, probably over other forms of the social sciences, was its ability to tell a good story. But it's not just about telling someone else's story. 
As King reminds us, sometimes we say, I've never heard that story before. But once we have heard it, we then have to ask ourselves, what does it mean? How is it going to change my practice? He challenges us to think about the power that stories have. So often we see with Indigenous histories, they get called things like dreaming stories. They get reduced to being children's fables. But we know that our stories are the foundation for ethical and sustainable ways of engaging not just with each other, but with the metaphysical world and with our environment. Just to the west of us in Newcastle, there's a rock that is shaped like a frog. And if you've come through the Australian schooling system in the last probably 25 years, you may have heard the story of Tidlick the Frog. And it's that story. So in our stories, in our histories, Tidlick drank all of the water that was available. So plants, animals, ecosystems, all of them were suffering. Finally, he was made to laugh and he released that water back into the environment. In a primary school sense, and even sometimes for adults, people see that as a representation of saying, don't be greedy. But it's far more than that. It's an understanding that no one owns water. Yeah. And that's a message that I think that we need in Australia today. So many anthropological accounts that I've read talk about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people's connection to water. The response to the Uluru Statement from the Heart from the Torres Strait Islander Council is called the voice from the deep water. For my people, the rivers and the oceans are you know, our spiritual homeland as much as our land. So I think that the first thing that we should really acknowledge in the academy is that stories not only have power, stories shape practice, stories shape change, and in fact, new stories may save our world. If we can't find a story to tell together around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges, then we miss out on a fundamental element of understanding this country, which I believe we all love. Okay. So in the university now, we are often reminded to think about the sustainable development goals. And the first one of those is no poverty. And while Indigenous peoples are not specifically in these 17 goals, they're certainly there in any of the strategies and plans that are made to address these pressing global issues. So I want you to take a moment and imagine a society with no word for poverty. When I ask students to do this, they almost always come back with immediately John Lennon's imagine comes to mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Imagine there's no hunger. Yeah. Imagine there's no, imagine a society with no word for poverty. Well, in both my languages, there is no word for poverty. So I don't need to imagine it because I already live it. So if we're going to address these so-called wicked problems, perhaps the countries where poverty is a word of their creation and the conditions for poverty are of their creation, perhaps they are not the best 
to lead in how to address poverty. So obviously in our language, there is a way to say that you don't have something. But there's not a way to say that you don't have something because it was at the detriment of another person. There are laws and protocols around not taking resources until there are none left. And I wanna argue later in my talk that I think that that's possibly a metaphor for how Aboriginal studies and anthropology can move forward together talking about Aboriginal issues. Because for a long time in Australia, the primary intellectual group, the primary discipline that went to Aboriginal people was anthropologists. Today, there are many disciplines that are going to Aboriginal communities. And there is a sense in which we need to address whether or not we are going to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities as a resource for our endeavours or are we a resource for theirs? Because at some point, if you go too many times to the waterhole, you'll deplete it, you'll sully it, and you'll make it so that no one can use it. So we need, I think, as academics, to show careful custodianship and stewardship in how many times we go to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and in how much time and how many resources we expect to get from them. All right, so I live with kids um, who are no longer really Facebook active, it's all Instagram. Um, but once upon a time when Facebook for them was cool and I was cool because I was on Facebook, um, they introduced me to this idea about a relationship status. It's complicated. <laughs> And I think for anthropology and Aboriginal studies, that's an amazing way to characterise <laughs> our relationship. It's not that we don't want a relationship. It's not that we don't care about each other. It's not that we don't recognise each other's strengths. And it's not that we don't whinge about each other's weaknesses. <laughs> but we haven't yet managed to find a way for those relationships to be strong and ongoing. And as the head of Wallatuka, um, which supports the largest cohort of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in Australia, we're seeking to create that relationship. We'd like to say in a relationship with anthropology. We'd like to say in a relationship with mathematics, not me personally, but <laughs> I'm a little bit maths challenged, you know, but at one point I worked as the senior project officer for ACARA on the first national curriculum for kindergarten, or as they call it here, foundations to, uh, to year 10 uh, in Australia. And I had the opportunity to work with a lot of mathematicians and they would say things to me like, is there a place for Aboriginal knowledges? And I'd say, well, what do you need for maths? And they'd say, well, we don't need ancient knowledge. We need modern knowledge. We don't need something that's from another culture. We need something that's from Australia, which, I mean, there was a whole irony in that anyway, but okay. Uh, and we need something that kids can really identify with and everything else doesn't have a place in the Australian curriculum. And I would say to them, well, my daughter, this one, will be very pleased to hear that. And they said, why? And I said, well, you can't have Pythagoras. And they're like, what do you mean? And I said, well, it's hardly modern knowledge. It's not from Australia. It's not from this culture. And kids don't like it. So 
Um, bye. And they would then say, but, but wait a minute, we have to have that knowledge because it's useful. Okay. So we actually don't mind if we have older knowledges as long as they're perceived to be useful. And what I believe, and, you know, it, it's great to be amongst anthropologists because what I think you believe as well is that Indigenous knowledges are also useful. I'd also have discussions with um, people from English and they tell me the same thing. And they, you know, it's got to be from Australia. It's got to be modern. It's got to be in, you know, modern Australian English. And I'd say, same thing, this poor kid. Um, my daughter will be really happy. Why? No Shakespeare then. So we need to deconstruct our arguments around how we've come to exclude Indigenous knowledges as frameworks and building blocks for the modern world. A lot of those same people would say to me, I don't really see the value in Aboriginal studies. Like, why don't we have, uh, and they, they'd use various terms, but the most common one was, you know, why don't you have white Australian studies? Why don't you have white studies? And I say, well, actually, you know, you do. And they'd look at me and they, their little brows would be furrowed and they'd say, no, we don't. And I say, you do, the clue's in the title. No. And then I'd say, it, it's the only subject that's compulsory all the way through school. And what do you mean? English. English. If we called that English studies, it's exactly the same as learning Aboriginal studies. It's about knowing cultures and histories, the ethical frameworks that they provide. It's about getting cultural literacy. So if, if we can have English studies be compulsory, then surely in our own country, we can have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander studies be compulsory, if not the foundation of how we approach our world. Because I don't find things like European seasonal calendars particularly useful here. I don't find um, so many of the introduced crops or animals particularly useful here. And I also don't find a lot of the ways of thinking about and interacting with other people particularly useful or ethical here. So I'm very much an advocate of Aboriginal studies, but as a relatively recent addition to the academy, we can't exist and we can't do it on our own at the moment. That's something for down the road, I hope. But I also hope that like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from our histories, that we're flexible and responsive and that we can take in other ways of being, knowing and doing. And that's going to mean in terms of this complicated relationship that we're going to need to get over the siloing and our very strong bias towards simply having things our own way. So on my next slide, I want to be slightly controversial. Rugby league. Okay. <laughs> the South Sydney Rabbits. So, um, you know, with a family, uh, with... Uh, a migration history to Waterloo and Redfern. Uh, I was born in, in South Sydney and as a family, um, we follow South Sydney. I've come down, of course, to the heartland of AFL <laughs> and um, so I'm putting it out there that uh, I'm not gonna say which is better. You know, we can all have a personal opinion but a personal opinion isn't a way forward. 
a personal opinion is potentially something that is just going to get us in a circle that doesn't have any practical action. One of the things um, my academic coordinator from Wallatook is here with me, and one of the activities that we do in a core section that we teach for the Bachelor of Social Science is we get students debating whether or not a battered piece of potato is called a potato cake <laughs> or a potato scallop. People become really, really invested in that. <laughs> like, don't they, Shell? Really invested in that debate. And I think similarly that we become really invested in our disciplines. And it's fine to be invested in your discipline, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily need to deny or degrade people with other perspectives who sit there watching the rugby league eating a potato scallop. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we wanted to, to, to just pick out some photos and use them and say, what does it actually mean? How is this about our real life world? Because each and every one of us has that. And I can remember being first, second, third year anthropology and getting um, assessment items that asked us to practice reflexivity. What a gift. What if we actually asked all of our students? What if we held ourselves to the concept of reflexivity? We think that being reflexive is the foundation of Aboriginal cultures. We think that being reciprocal is the foundation for Aboriginal cultures. What if, as a body of scholars, we were able to enact that? So this is number one son, 2010, 2021. Um, his name's Andrew, we call him Andy Roo, um, because his favorite uh, form of Aboriginal dance is, is as the kangaroo. And you can see that um, he's been doing that for quite a long period of time. <laughs> so he's a big fella now. And if you look actually under his, um, his right arm in the 2021 photo, you see my great nephew um, dancing behind him, just, just peering through. So again, this idea of generations, of asking generations to step up. We see in our academy in Australia, the social sciences under attack. So we need to think about what are we giving to the next generation? How are we creating an environment that is going to nurture that generation to respond, to speak back to the academy, to speak for the value of the social sciences? If we can get our disciplines to work together, then we're going to be a lot stronger. But if we're going to try to, as individual disciplines, argue for our value, we may very well fail. So the future of what you know, I think is the foundation of the tertiary system, you know, the strength of the social sciences, needs unity, needs collaboration, and needs reciprocity. We need not just for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we need a reconciliation between our disciplines. And that's going to mean uh, that we will need to make our relationships in a new way. So, People, you know, tend to think, aha, uh -huh, this is an Aboriginal man, a young Aboriginal man, he does Aboriginal dance. That's um, the way that he experiences his culture in Australian life in the 21st century. So I want to look now at a little photo. This is my, my baby son, 
So my baby son is now six foot five. But once upon a time, he was not only my baby son, he was my little son. And this is him in kindergarten. Here's his very first Easter hat parade day. And the kids all went down, they did their Easter hat parade. And when they came back to the classroom, the Easter bunny had been, and the window was open, some chairs had been turned over, and there were footprints showing how the Easter bunny had gone around the classroom. And in the spirit of using their investigative skills, the kids were asked to create the narrative of what happened with the Easter bunny. And so they said things like, well, we think he came in the window and he went out the door and knocked the chair is over this way. And, and my little son, um, Harry, we call him Hazza, um, not from Harry, but because he set my parents' kitchen on fire. And, um, <laughs> so it's hazardous materials. <laughs> uh, so Hazza went forward and you can see there, he crouched down, he reached out and he touched the footprint and he, he got the material and he rubbed it between his fingers, sniffed it, touched it on his tongue. And those are all skills that he'd been taught about how to track. You know? So if it's, if it's wetter, it's more likely to have been recent. What does it smell like? You know, what does it taste like? And the teacher watched him doing all that. And then she said to him, Harry, um, what can you tell us about the Easter Bunny? And he said, uh, and this is, you know, I think a good example of taking traditional knowledge and applying it in new and innovative contexts. He said, it is clear that the Easter Bunny had a shower before he came. And she went, oh, how did you come to that conclusion? And he said, because the Easter Bunny leaves powdered footprints like my nan. <laughs> so I think that one of the things about Aboriginal knowledge today is that it's there all the time. Just because we're not seeing it differently He's not there being the kangaroo. He was initially thinking, you know, what, what could this have been? But we struggle to have people see that as urban Aboriginal people, as people in the academy, that we do actually bring a different lens to the way that we approach the world. Anthropologists of all people should be the ones to be able to see that's what we do. Anthropologists of all people should be our champions, should stand with us in having our cultures recognised. When Thomas King talked about stories and if you know a story, you have, you know, a choice about what to do with it, anthropology has over a century of hearing our stories. What are you going to do with it? Does it provide you with a passion to advocate? Does it provide you with a passion to help those in our community who want to reclaim our knowledge? Does it provide you with a mandate to speak when you need to? to overturn fallacies about the death of Aboriginal culture and the success of assimilation. These, I think, are the new reflexive frontiers for us to start to think about and for us to have conversations about. So, um, of course, friends for non black skin, white masks, Immediately, again, I saw myself. Uh, so I'd say this is probably 1977, 76, and the Batgirl show, girl, uh, show bag was the premiere, probably the only one 
excuse me, the only one that really represented um, uh, women. And Batgirl, God bless her, with her china white skin, thanks, Shell, with her china white skin and her red hair, was the mask of choice for young girls at the Sydney Easter show. And my long suffering grandmother there um, is being attacked by uh, Batgirl. I think the, the strangely fragile plastic cape had long departed. And so I do have my Supergirl cape on there, which is probably indicative of the fact that I might have been slightly overinvested in the whole superhero narrative. <laughs> um, but it's also reflective that I wanted to have in popular culture powerful female role models. And one of the things that I'm really grateful for is that in real life, I have powerful female role models. But when I came into anthropology and I saw the work of Gillian Cowlishaw and I saw the work of Gaynor MacDonald, I also found powerful female role models. And then when Aboriginal women stepped into the space, people like um, distinguished professor Aileen Morton Robinson, distinguished professor Marcy Langton, I saw powerful female role models. And over time, I had the opportunity to slowly, I think, transition from having to put the white mask on in the academy to being able to really be myself. So I think that, again, what we need to do is to think about the masks that we wear. And we all do it. I don't speak the same in, in this company as I would, you know, in a community organisation. Um, and I don't see a problem in doing that code switching. That's not me being inauthentic. That's me changing myself to fit the needs of the people that I'm talking to. And rather than that be seen as me diminishing or degrading them, I think it's about empowering their voices and their ways of being. And I found that much, much easier in Aboriginal studies. I don't think in many ways that I could have um, achieved that in a mainstream discipline in the 1990s. Maybe I could now. Maybe I have the opportunity now because, you know, I am the head of an institute. It's so much easier when you have an idea and you think, hmm, I wonder if I could get approval for that. And then you go, do I approve? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, so um, it's also, obviously it's also about power. But many of you that are in the room today or who might watch this later, you have the power to amplify other people's voices, to mm -hmm. amplify other people's wishes. And you know, that, I think, is you know, a true contribution to social justice. Looks like watch. Okay. So, so these are my great grandparents and uh, in the, the group photo, my great grandparents are in the center. Um, the lady in the hat behind them is my great great grandmother uh, who uh, did not speak English. Uh, I remember my great grandmother a little from when I was a child. Um, the photo of the group is taken around the time that they were recorded by Norman Tyndale in the Tyndale genealogies as being at Woodenbong. Uh, my great grandmother into the seventies, um, right up until she died, was um, being recorded by linguists and uh, recordings of her speaking are held in the archives at AATSIS. 
the joy that my family got to have those recordings again, to hear her voice, um, I, I can't even explain to you. So when I, when I look at anthropology, I think of, of all the stories and all the voices that you've captured and the incredible gift that that could be if those materials were repatriated to the descendants of the people whose voices were once captured. We talk about taking remains home, but I think that we also need to talk about taking voices home and stories home. And that's one of the things which I would really uh, love to see. I looked again in the, the photo box. So this is a photo from, um, it's a group from the Foundation for Aboriginal Affairs. And there used to be a festival uh, in Sydney that was called the Waratah Festival. Mm. And uh, the Foundation for Aboriginal Affairs put a float in where the goal was to show the broader community that Aboriginal people can do and be anything. And the debutante there at the front is Mama. Mm. So you can see there uh, Charlie Perkins uh, as an academic, there's Jimmy Little. Gary Williams, who was a, um, a, a tip stove to a judge, I think at that time, um, but now does an incredible amount of work uh, in language revitalization of Bumbangi. Uh, there's um, the Mercy Sisters, their students. And I find it ironic that a whole generation later, we still have to show non-Aboriginal people that Aboriginal people can be anything and do anything. So I'm hoping that for my grandkids, that that'll be something that we've moved past. You know, I'm still seeing it with my own kids, the first to do this, the first to do that, the constant having to see themselves held against a yardstick uh, about white Australia, mainstream Australia, being our aspiration. When I've used this photo in teaching, initially a lot of the time students will say, well, it's an example of uh, assimilation. It's not an example of assimilation. These were all people who were incredibly proud of being Aboriginal. These are all people who went on in various ways and in various settings, whether it was empowering their own families or empowering broader communities or empowering our nation. These were people who went on to show broader Australia, not just that Aboriginal people can hold positions of the same title or achieve the same things, but that we can do it without compromising our values, our cultural values and our cultural selves. And yep, we're still one generation on, still having to have that argument. I don't leave my culture at the door simply because I step onto the university campus. A funny story, um, my, my deputy head of school, Dr. Ray Kelly and I like to tell this story about when uh, we were invited to go and do an acknowledgement of country and welcome for a visitor to the university that was coming in by helicopter and we thought oh, you know this is different so we we went to the fields and we were standing there on the car park and a helicopter came in and uh, someone from the university said to us after the helicopter had landed well, you want to go and meet them on the grass, won't you? Because that's country. <laughs> and, and, and then they sort of turned and ran towards the grass. So we looked at each other and went, <laughs> um, And so we went across. The helicopter's rotors hadn't been turned off. So it's going and buffeting us with wind. 
and we're yelling in language a welcome. And uh, we turned around and we walked off and we we're having a little giggle as we were walking away. Then as we went to get back in the car, we turned around with serious faces. And, but one of the things that we've said we'd love to do in the future is to write a paper called Car Park is Country. <laughs> because no matter what you put on top of country, it's still country. It's still intrinsically our sovereign land. It doesn't matter if this building is built over it, country still exists. So we sometimes see in the university people saying, well, if only we could get out on country. You are on country. You're on country every day. So we need in the same way as we argue that as Aboriginal people, you know, holding different roles, we still have culture. We need to also be the advocates for country that no matter what, you put on top of it and no matter what is done to it country is still there and country is still powerful some of the things which we do may seem to diminish it but country will always come back and country is our our foundation so this um this was a photo that my mum showed me and the Aboriginal man who's standing there is um, Herbert Groves. And he was a bit of a mentor to my mum when she was younger. And he held the position on the Aborigines Welfare Board of New South Wales of being what was termed the half-caste representative. And this is him addressing the board. So you can see, um, those of you who know what it is, what he looks like. You can see um, Elkin, AP Elkin is sitting there. Um, there would also be the representatives at the chief of police or his representative, members of the clergy. But um, if we look at that, I'm going to say that it probably exemplifies to me the criticism, well referenced, that um, there's been an overabundance of white men in charge of Aboriginal policy. And when Bert was speaking there and the way that it was reported in the Dawn magazine, which was the, um, the magazine of the board, uh, he said, I suggest that we create a panel of trained Aboriginal people to tell the story from our own point of view. I, I found coming into anthropology that the training that I got enabled me to speak in a different way to a different audience. I don't require the university to teach me how to speak as an Aboriginal person. I already know that. I don't require schools to teach my children pride in their culture. I already do that. My husband does that. My parents do that my broader family and my community do that. What we need is tools to take it to the next level. What's the turbo upgrade of your discipline? What's the turbo upgrade of my discipline? Because if we're just replicating the old methods, then maybe we're not tools that are fit for purpose. And I think again, I take this from Tom Ray, the deputy head at Wallachika, the idea of the two-way conversation where it's not just, and this is probably not a good example, but it's not just an example of a monologue and then a response. It's an actual dialogue. Those are, you know, I think the things that, that are going to take us forward. So this is my, my grandmother's family, um, my great-grandparents. So they, they are uh, Waramai people from Port Stephens. My great-grandparents were placed on Karua mission uh, and they were able, um, they were able to leave. But I can find in the records of the missionaries over 20 years later that they talked about going to visit 
their faithful servants, Mary and Archie Russell. And some people have said, oh, I think that that's just a metaphor from the Christian tradition. And I said, well, it, it might be to your frame of mind, except that my grandmother was a, a servant at Tali Bible College. She was sent from the mission uh, as a young girl to be a servant to the missionaries. So I think they may have actually meant so. But thank you for your input. <laughs> so I'm much appreciated. Uh, but again, that only comes from me knowing her story. So, yeah, it makes perfect sense that, you know, you, you look at that Christian tradition and we're servants of Christ and all of that kind of thing. But she actually was their servant as a 12-year-old girl. And she didn't have a choice to leave because she was under the Aborigines Protection Act. So when the missionaries were still coming to visit them in the 1940s, even after they had been married for 20 years and they'd had their children, those missionaries had the power to have them taken back to the mission. So again, it's about power and the power of the story and knowing what that story is. And that's where truth telling sits. All right, so what are we doing at Wallachika about this? Well, we're talking about um, a framework. And I started talking about it before. You know, is the community your resource or are you the resource for the community? So Balon uh, in, in our language is the word for river. So if you're familiar, familiar with Balama, um, that's where that comes from. And Jalam is the word for fish. So we know when we look at colonial records that uh, the Aboriginal people around Sydney Harbour were absolutely horrified when the British went out and bought in enormous amounts of fish. They simply couldn't comprehend it. We know that when Baron Guru was angry with her husband, Benelong, for going with the colonists, that she broke his fishing spear. Um, so we know that there's a value there around water and around fish. When we look at how our people on the coast, so we're saltwater people, but even when we look at our freshwater brothers, sisters, and siblings, inland we see that they use the idea of a fish trap and the fish trap is something that is permeable so fish and the water are there but the fish don't die so you only take them when you need them and when you look at the law for different aboriginal communities fish traps like the Bawarana fish traps which it's argued is the oldest, if you know, one of, if not the oldest human made structure in this country. If you look at uh, the law around those fish traps, they are on someone's land, but no one can be denied water and no one can be denied fish. So if we think about our knowledge and our relationships as a river flowing, where are you? Are you on the bank? Do you uh, fish for recreation? Is that just something which you enjoy to do? Do you fish because it's something that you need to sustain you? And do you think about when you're fishing? So do you think about when the fish are spawning? Do you think about the seasons we've all I think in the tertiary sector been through a period of, of drought in terms of the resources that we have how prepared were we for that so when we talk about sustainability and when we talk about indigenous knowledges we have the opportunity to think that there will be times of plenty there will be times where there is less 
And there will be times where we need to be the stewards of resources so that other people can be nourished, not just us. And so that's the framework that we're trying to bring to our relationships. We see this um, as a foundational concept that we're developing to inform not just our research, but also our pedagogy and our international engagement. Because we know that Indigenous peoples worldwide have similar practices. You know, the fish trap um, goes worldwide for Aboriginal people. The consideration of not taking the spawning fish, the consideration of not depleting uh, our resources to where they no longer exist. These are the concerns of our global Indigenous family. And again, you are the ones who can amplify those voices and those perspectives. You are the ones that could make space for Indigenous peoples to speak. And you are the ones who could invite more Indigenous people into your discipline and perhaps see your discipline refreshed and transformed. We all know what it's like to get that influx of fresh water after rain. Maybe we're the rain to, uh, to refresh old systems. Okay, so final photo, um, it's my parents' wedding. You know, unfortunate that that's across their faces, but there you go. Um, so my dad is um, a non-Aboriginal man, and that's, well, sadly, because they're tall, while the rest of the family is short, it's my dad and, and his twin brother that have their heads cut off. But um, if you look in the family photo box, that's not the first time. So, <laughs> uh, and then um, the rest of the bridal party there are my, my mother's family. So my dad and my uncle were born in Gilgandra, out near Dubbo, and my nan needed help from a nurse. And there was an Aboriginal nurse, Isabel McCallum, who was the daughter of William Ferguson, one of the uh, leaders of you know, Aboriginal people and alliances between New South Wales and Victoria in the 1930s uh, in terms of things like the Day of Mourning and um, the Aborigines Progressive Association. And Nan needed a nurse and, you know, she was actually told that she could have a nurse but it would have to be an Aboriginal girl. And Nan said, yeah, I don't care. It's fine. And um, Izzy, as she became known to the family, was, um, you know, such a, a godsend to the family. And after my dad's family moved to Sydney, um, Izzy invited uh, my, my grandparents, my dad and my uncles to go to a dance for fundraising for a new Aboriginal organisation. And actually, mum saw my uncle first, um, didn't find him attractive, which is ironic, given that he's my father's identical twin. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, eyes met dad across a crowded room and, you know, the rest is, um, as they say, is, is history. So I think that um, from that particular story, yeah, you know, I've always believed that there are non-Aboriginal people who uh, can be supportive of um, Aboriginal causes and who can create meaningful, long-lasting relationships with Aboriginal people and truly become part of their family, yeah? So if we think about those genealogies of knowledge, then I think maybe that's a good way to think about how we could become a family. We're maybe not families by blood, 
but we could become families by the relationships that we create and by you know the the strength and the longevity of how we seek to be stewards of really good positive um, relationships so i mean with my dad my family you know, first and foremost, got someone who was tall enough to change a light globe <laughs> just standing on the floor. And that, um, that, was, that was amazing. But over time, they saw someone who created space to listen. So he would drive my mum, her mother, her grandmother back to Kuru Mission to see my grandmother's brother and his wife. And he would walk and just listen to the stories. My husband does the same. So I've seen in practice what it looks like when you come to love other people. You know, sometimes I think we don't talk enough about what we love. But for the most part, when I've talked to academics in the university, they're doing what they do because they love it. It's not just a job. It's a passion and it's a vocation. And if we're all coming to the same place with love, then surely we can share that. How does love become conflict? And how can love be a foundation? <laughs>